Welcome back to the next video, everybody. Today, we are gonna talk about the mysterious Fry curve. So this is video 1.7. So recall, where did we leave off when trying to prove Fermat's theorem? We reduced the problem down to the following statement. Let P be a prime that's at least five. Let's suppose A to the P plus B to the P plus C to the P is zero, where A, B, and C are integers. Then at least one of A, B, or C is zero. Okay, so let's take a prime P at least five. And let's assume there is a non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation with exponent p. Let's try to find a contradiction. What you do is you build what's called a, the Fry curve associated to this solution. We'll call this curve e sub f, or rather we'll call it its model e sub f, and it's given by y squared equals x times x minus a to the p times x plus b to the p. Now this is a Weierstrass model of an elliptic curve over the rationals because the roots on the right-hand side here are distinct, right? For example, a to the p can't be negative b to the p because otherwise c to the p would be zero. And so our solution ABC would be trivial, which would contradict the non-triviality. Similarly, you also can't have a to the p equals zero or b to the p equals zero because then otherwise a or b would be zero. And again, our solution wouldn't be non-trivial. So this is actually an elliptic curve, a Weierstrass model for an elliptic curve over the rationals. Okay, so who cares? First of all, let's make some reductions. Um, as usual, we can assume the entries of our solution are pairwise co prime. We talked about that when proving exponents three and four. Okay, we can also assume that A is negative one mod four and that B is even. Um, indeed, so not all of A, B, and C can be odd as you can check from the Fermat equation. So you can assume without loss of generality by the symmetry of that equation that B is even. But that forces A and C to be odd because we've assumed that our entries are pairwise co prime, A, B, and C, right? So A and C are plus or minus one mod four, but a and C can't both be one respectively negative one mod four, because if so, then if you reduce the Fermat equation mod four, you get either two equals zero mod four or negative two equals zero mod four, which is a contradiction because it doesn't make sense, okay? And so by the symmetry of the equation, I can assume without loss of generality that it's A that's negative one mod four. Okay, well, you take your Fry curve, you do some calculations on it. First, you compute the discriminant. You get 16 ABC to the two P. That shows you that the given model is not a global minimum model because two to the 14th certainly divides this because you have a two to the fourth here and then you know B is even and P is at least five. Okay, and then you also can check easily by calculating C4 that two to the fourth divides C4. And so by our global minimal model checks, we know that the model that we gave for the Fry curve is not global minimum. Okay, you can use Tate's or Laska's algorithm, which can be found in Silverman's Advanced Topics on Elliptic Curve S2 Chapter 4 or in the modular functions of one variable four book. Basically, there's an algorithm you can take to take, there's an algorithm you can use to take a given Weierstrass model and make sure that it ends up in global minimal form over the rationals. You do that, you run your, your Fry curve through that model, you get your, your global minimal model, and then you calculate the minimal discriminant of the Fry curve, delta sub m of ef, and you find that it's two to the negative eight times abc to the two p. These are just calculations. Okay, I talk a little bit about here, if you wanna pause and see how Fry did this originally, like what the changes of variables you need are to actually go from the given model to the global minimal model, okay? And it's the fact that B is even and that A is negative one mod four that allows you to see that these coefficients are actually integers, for example, okay? So just a little touch of number theory for you here. Let K over Q be a number field with ring of integers, okay. So a number field is just a finite extension of Q and the ring of integers in a number field is the set of all elements in the field to satisfy monoclonomials with integer coefficients. So we say that K is unramified at a prime P and Z. If when you take the ideal P okay and factor it into prime ideals, which you know is always possible. Let's say those prime ideals are frac P sub I to the E sub I power. Uh, so we're going to say K is unramified at P if all these E sub I's are less than or equal to one. In other words, when you take P and you sort of think of it as an ideal upstairs in K, you factor it into primes there, you factor it into distinct primes. There's no repeated primes, okay? Um, for the algebraic geometry people, this ties in with the ordinary notion of geometric ramification because the inclusion Z into OK admits a map spec OK to spec Z of affine schemes. And then ramification in the field theoretic sense, as I've just defined it, corresponds to ramification geometrically along this map in the sense that a prime P and Z ramifies uh, field theoretically, if and only if its pre-image in spec OK contains at least a double point frac P, okay? Okay, here's the key crucial proposition of the video. Heuristic evidence of the weirdness of the Fry curve. Proposition one, 
So let's let P be prime at least five. Let's let A, B, and C be pairwise co-prime integers constituting a non-trivial solution to the Fermat equation with exponent P, where without loss of generality, A is negative one mod four and B is even. Then E sub F is a semi-stable elliptic curve. So it has everywhere good or multiplicative reduction whose minimal discriminant, the global minimal discriminant and conductor are given by delta sub M of E sub F is two to the negative eight times ABC to the two P that we already proved. And the conductor of E sub F is the product over all primes that divide ABC. Furthermore, the field K sub P gotten by adjoining the coordinates of the P torsion of the Fry curve to Q is unramified over Q outside two P. So there's very little ramification actually. Okay, so proof, I'll, I'll prove this in pretty good detail actually. Uh, you can check from reduction of the original model for E sub F that if L is a prime that isn't two, then E sub F has good reduction at L if L doesn't divide ABC, and that E sub F has multiplicative reduction at L if L does divide ABC. So this is just calculations. If L is two, just reduce the global minimal model of E sub F to find that there's multiplicative reduction at two. Sayer gives a, a little bit of these arguments in his Sayer Conjectures paper, which I'll call SRM from here on out, okay? Okay, well, that's by definition, then E sub F is semi-stable, and I found the conductor, and I already found the minimal discriminant before, so I'm done with the first part of the proposition. So how about this whole P torsion business? So I want to show KP over Q is unramified outside 2P, right? So let's fix a prime L at which E sub F has multiplicative reduction, and we'll view E sub F as an elliptic curve over the L attic numbers. By the theory of the Tate curve, so Tate uniformization from the previous video, we know that the P torsion of E sub F over Q sub L is just Q sub L adjoins zeta sub P and Q to the one over P, where Q satisfies that e sub, the Q bar L points of E sub F are isomorphic to Q bar star sub L mod Q to the Z, according to Tate uniformization from the end of last video. And zeta sub P is just a primitive P through root of unity. Um, you need a little bit of Galois theory and the Galois equivariance of the so-called Bay pairing to see why this root of unity shows up for primes of arbitrary reduction type but we'll talk about this in chapter three later. Basically, if, if, if something fixes all P torsion, it will automatically fix zeta sub P. So that's what's going on here. Okay, by basic ramification theory, it suffices to consider the ramification of L in Q sub L adjoins zeta sub P, Q to the one over P over Q sub L. That is, I can look locally to determine ramification. I don't have to look globally. Like I can put L's here basically. Okay, so, um, well, now you can just use some standard results. So Q sub L adjoins zeta sub P is unramified over Q sub L exactly away from P by basic cyclotomic theory. Let me, Neukirch covers this, for example. And Q sub L adjoins Q to the one over P is unramified over Q sub L at L if and only if the L attic valuation of Q is an integer multiple of P. Um, I'll say a little bit about why this is true. So we're dealing with discrete valuation rings here. So, so things are kind of easy. You just really have to consider ramification of uniformizers in a couple of enlightening cases. So one case would be maybe when Q is L. And another case would be when the L attic valuation of Q is just P. Okay. Uh, a uniformizer on the bottom, so in Q sub L, is just L, right? So if Q is L, so for in this case, a, unifi a uniformizer up top is L to the one over P. So I have complete and utter ramification of L in this case, which is what, which is what I said was gonna happen. In the other case, if the L attic valuation of Q is P, a uniformizer pi up top is just L times U to the one over P for some unit U. But then the ideal generated by pi is the ideal generated by L as ideals. In other words, there's no ramification. So these toy cases essentially say exactly what I was trying to tell you, okay? Um, don't worry about it too much though, because. I'm, a, I'm okay being a little vague here because what we're gonna end up proving here about the Fry curve is going to end up only being heuristic evidence for the fact that this magical, mysterious, non-trivial solution to the Fermat equation is actually a contradiction, okay? Okay, so we have this. Um, now L is a prime of multiplicative reduction for E sub F, right? And so uh, when is it gonna be true that the L attic valuation of Q is an integer multiple of P? That's going to happen if and only if the L attic valuation of the minimal discriminant of E sub F is an integer multiple of P. Okay, you can see that from this string of equations here. So the L attic valuation of the minimal discriminant of E sub F turns out to be the negative of the L attic valuation of the J invariant of E sub F. Then that is the L attic valuation of Q, the Q from Tate uniformization. Okay, so it's very clear that this this equality here in particular is just a symbolic version of what I said. So now the question is, why are these two equalities true? Well, 
The first equality uses the fact that the J invariant is C4 cubed over the minimal discriminant, right? But L doesn't divide this piece right here by the multiplicativity of the reduction of the Fry curve at L. You can see Silverman 1 chapter 7 for why that's true. Okay, so that's where we're using multiplicative reduction. How about the second equality here? Why is this true? That comes from Tate uniformization. By the theory of the Tate curve, we know the J invariant of the Fry curve is 1 over Q plus a power series in Q with integer coefficients. Well, that says exactly that this is true, right? Okay, perfect. Now, what if L is a prime of good reduction instead of a prime of multiplicative reduction? Well, then I got you covered. There's a theorem, Niran og shaparevich which is covered in Silverman 1, Chapter 7, and we'll talk about it later, that says that KP over Q is just unramified at L if L isn't P. In the case, L is a prime of good reduction. So take the two results, the multiplicative reduction results, and good reduction results, and combine them. And what do you find? You find that the only ramification um, at L in KP happens either when L equals P, so maybe from this case, uh, well, we actually also saw that up here in the multiplicative case, this extension was unramified exactly away from P. So ramification could happen at P in either case. Or the other thing we saw is that you could have ramification when the power of L dividing the minimal discriminant of the Fry curve isn't an integer multiple of P. But if you just go back up and look at the minimal discriminant, you see that that happens if and only if L is two, right? I mean, every other power here is an integer multiple of P. So, so basically ramification can only happen at two P, but that's exactly what the proposition says, okay? Now, who cares, right? Uh, one reason this is significant is the following. The discriminant and the conductor should be close in general. In fact, they should be very tightly connected. So we have this Spiro's conjecture that says for epsilon positive, there is a C positive such that for every elliptic curve E over Q at once, so C is independent of E, the minimal discriminant of E and the conductor of E satisfy this equation here, this inequality. The minimal discriminant of E in absolute value is less than C times the conductor to the six plus epsilon power. And it turns out the global minimal model of the Fry curve provides a counterexample to this conjecture. And I'll tell you a slightly more precise version of this conjecture is actually equivalent to the ABC conjecture. So this is probably not wrong. And so there's definitely something weird and fishy going on here. However, this is just conjectural strong heuristic evidence that the existence of a non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation, prime exponent P at least five is actually problematic. However, this does give us justification in analyzing Fermat's last theorem from the Diophantine angle. And so we will attack from Oslo's theorem beginning next video, still through the lens of, of arithmetic geometry and algebraic number theory, but from a different angle, and that angle will be through the use of Galois representations. So I'll start developing the theory of uh, the basic theory of Galois representations next video. So I'll see you then. And thanks for watching.